Hey, everyone. Uh, first, I want to get one thing out of the way. It's not Jeff Ward. It's Susan. Everybody else calls me Susan, so please do. Uh, if you want to know why, look me up after this. Uh, but, you know, it's fun. Uh, like I said, I'm Susan. Jeff Ward from DeepGram. We do speech to text. And I'm going to try to talk to you about why speech is in the revolution stage right now and what it takes to do speech in real time. And that's, that's really the core of this. It is a challenge to use all these really amazing, cool, deep learning tools in real time, get the performance that you need out of them. And that's what we have tackled quite a bit. So let's go forward with this. Why is speech important? Anybody got an idea? Thoughts? Well, we're using it right now. But the real deal is this. When you look around and you look through history, the majority of revolutions in computers really are about input and output. You didn't like the Wii because of its processor. You liked the Wii because of its, its controller. You didn't like the Atari because of you know, the, the amount of memory it had. You cared about the joystick and the, the, the graphics on it. Speech is an untapped input and output. Well, it's becoming tapped as we speak about it. And it is super important that we get it right now and make that input and output available to everybody in this room. So what's spurring these advances? Um, just talk about the quick history of speech. Back in the 50s and 60s, not on this slide, we started with the idea of um, computers and speech recognition, but super fragile. You had to be the exact participant that was ready for. It had very few words, that kind of thing. That continued through the 70s, and up into the 90s, we started finally seeing some real commercialization, some ability to increase vocabulary and be a little more durable with the type of you know, the person using the speech recognition. It wasn't really until we started getting 2010s where everybody really starts thinking, this is something useful. This is something amazing, something that we build into products and are making real serious money about. And that was spurred with amazing academic improvements, great hardware improvements, a lot of smart things have happened. We are on this inflection point right now. Where are we going with speech is general purpose, being able to use, you know, step into pretty much any environment, use it and not think about it. What I think of as solved speech, where it's just something that's taken for granted and is no longer that cool thing you do a conference on because it's just that API. Let's get into the meat of things. What does it really take to build a speech recognition engine? First, I know this is going to be a massive shock to everybody out in the audience, but you need data. The first step of a good speech recognition or pretty much any machine learning project is large volumes of data. And from that, you're going to be training a pretty good general purpose model. But the core, the key aspect of making speech recognition good and fast is not having some massive, epic, general purpose model because, quite frankly, even human transcriptionists aren't able to do that. If you get into the medical field, for example, and you take a transcriptionist from, I don't know, something in aviation and throw them into the medical you know, environment, even though they're a professional over there, they're not going to be very good. Their error rates are going to be high. So you need that customization to really make things work. So as you can see from the graph here, you've got, I'm looking at my monitors, you're looking at theirs. Sorry about that. <laughs> you've got general purpose over here. It takes you know, many thousands of hours generally to get where you, you want to be. But if you go to domain-specific data based off of that initial general purpose model, you can get just in a few tens of hours amazing improvements. Really, customization is the key to making models smaller, which is a key to making them faster. But like I said, there's more to the data than just you know, the amount you've got and the domain-specific nature of it. You have to be good at manipulating that data. Um, uh, I've got an hour and a half worth of audio and text associated with that. I don't know how many, how many people have trained models, but even with huge amounts of RAM on your GPU or whatever you're using, putting an hour worth of audio and putting a big stack of RNNs, CNNs, and whatever else you're going to throw below it is not a realistic thing. So you have to cut this up into training bits. So that means you have a challenge, what we call alignment, chunking. You've got to be able to manipulate that data and fit words and text together and really be able to derive the training data that you need out of it. So let's talk about the inference pipeline. So imagine you finally have gotten all your data, um, tens of thousands of hours, lots of hundreds and thousands of hours in domain-specific areas. You've 
crack the code on how to turn that into viable training data to, to use. Now you've got a bunch of what are pretty obvious steps, but each one is at the core of making this fast. Clearly, the first step, you've got to bring that audio in and decode it. And one of the challenges to making speech a revolution is not just good word error rates. It's making it easy for your customers to use. And easy means using the audio they've got. If you force them to transcode it, turn it into your format, you're doing two, two disservices. First, you're potentially losing quality in a way that you don't want to. Right? If you get them to try to give you as raw of audio as possible, then you're going to get more uh, better word error rates out of it because you're, you get to control how you shrink it down into how your model deals with it. And second, the less they have to touch their data, the more they're going to be using your interface. Right? So step one, make sure that the audio decode, the, the, the supported audio coming in is uh, uh, you know, broad and easy. Next. We're going to talk briefly about segmentation. Again, GPUs are um, growing and becoming amazing. But you do have to have work with limitations on how much audio you, you are processing at a time. So we try to break the audio coming in, not on word boundaries for obvious reasons. We want whole words to, to be transcribed. Um, standard machine learning stuff happens after that. We're going to normalize the audio and then extract features out of it. And this is obviously clearly important. Um, every single machine learning model in the world doesn't like extremes. Nature in general does not like extremes. So we're just trying to cage the actual audio that comes in. And then there's a core piece here, batching. Um, actually, you know what? I've just realized I've got a whole slide on this. Let's go over this. Uh, <laughs> batching. So one of the huge, massive challenges for keeping a deep machine learning pipeline of, alive is making sure that your processing resources are completely stuffed. And if you're dealing with hundreds or thousands of different streams coming in from different customers, you want to coordinate and synchronize that. And sometimes you got high points, sometimes you got low points, sometimes you're seeing thousands and thousands of hours go through, and then maybe it's 2 in the morning and you don't see as much. So we spend a lot of time making sure that we have a really good custom batching algorithm that is going to try to predict the best way to keep that GPU stuffed without waiting too long um, and increasing the latency. So sometimes we'll do light batches just to get the response quick. Sometimes we'll be doing big batches to, to maximize the throughput. And it's just an, uh, a, a heuristic that looks at the previous uh, uh, requirements to predict the future. Um, so th from there, we get into the meat of things, inferencing. Now, again, the challenge here is how do you do good speech recognition? How do you do good anything in the machine learning world? And what we've learned in most fields is bigger generally does seem better. Um, you want to process images, you go to hundreds and hundreds of layers. You want to go and process text, you go to hundreds and hundreds of layers. So you see the same thing in a speech pipeline. We're going to take those features. We're going to dice it into little time slices, you know, 20, 30 milliseconds. Um, generally, you want to get these things small enough so that you're catching things like you know, phonemes and stuff like that. Then you're going to go through a generic, just a generic pipeline here of, of you know, a generic architecture here. Some sort of feature extraction set of layers like convolutional neural networks are excellent at feature extraction. Um, then you're going to go to uh, a good recurrent or other, you know, uh, a layer that's, that's good at collating information over time and you know, being able to look in different areas along the audio to match different words and figure out what might come next. And then finally, the meat, one of the big advances that allowed speech recognition to actually happen is predicting a series of outputs um, that act as probabilities. So for each little time slice in here, I could have you know, one of thousands of possible outcomes. They could be words, they, we could be predicting emotions, we could be predicting anything we want about this audio at this. For each little time slice, we have to predict the probability that that time slice represents that particular outcome. So we do that by taking a final dense from the output and then saying, here's 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 possible things, run it through softmax if uh, you understand the math behind here and say this is the one that's most likely pick the max and that's what it is 
But then we run through what's called a connection. In, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to step all over my tongue here, sorry. <laughs> connection is temporal classification, CTC, decode. So for all those time slices for, say, 10 in a row, it could be predicting the same word because the word went over more than 20 milliseconds. So what we need to do is go, hey, for these eight in a row, these 10 in a row, collapse them down to one. And this is the real key to predicting in speech is this, this you know, collapsing effect that when we do the final decode, we make sure we pick the highest, you know, go it down to one, and, and now you've got words or emotions or whatever it is you're predicting out of here. Phonemes depends on the type of model that you are training and what outputs you actually care about it. So that's the basics of a pipeline, but I want to focus on one thing here, and that is going back to the depth of this thing. The bigger the model, generally the better it is, but you run into performance issues, huge performance issues. So again, the key here on the real-time front is trying to make this model as small as possible to get the word error rates you're looking for, but still fast still accurate, still all these different things. So customization is a key component of real time. Without having a custom model, it's going to be a real challenge to take this massive general purpose model and give you the performance you want, be able to respond in milliseconds back to the audio coming in, complete that entire loop, and get a response back to the customer in, in a usable way. So you need these models to be small and Domain-specific models, domain-aware models, are really where it's at. Um, going on. Revolutions require ease of use, performance, and real time. That's what we need for our inputs, or for our inputs and outputs. The Wii controller, if it took some delay as you're going through here, you'd be annoyed with it, right? If it thought your arm was over there, you'd be annoyed with it. We need speech to be that way, too. So we really hammer the performance side of the house by dealing with the customization world. And when we're talking about the real-time world, you have a big trade-off that you have to deal with. So not only do you need to have a custom model that um, knows the domain and is accurate in that domain, but you need to have a way of giving that custom model, giving the customer um, a, the, the advantage of having the trade-off between accuracy and latency. So if you were to go into a room and I only gave you one second of audio out of that room and I told you to transcribe that one second, you'd have a hard time, even if you understood where that room was and who was talking. So if I gave you 10 seconds of audio, you'd probably have a much better time, a much better uh, you know, word error rate transcribing it. But with real time, I can't wait 10 seconds. So we give you the best of world. Or we believe the, the way to approach, uh, approach real time is to give you the best of both worlds. We're going to immediately give you back a short, maybe a little bit lower word error rate, or higher word error rate answer um, with a, an intermediary transcript. And keep on updating that. Keep on pushing it out to you as we get more information, as the audio comes in. We're going to keep on tacking on the new audio. You're going to keep on seeing new words. But the words before it may change. So you've got a, a, a moment in time that is flexible. Once we finally think we've gotten enough to give you the solid answer that you deserve, we're going to tell you it's, this is the final transcript. And that allows you now to say, OK, I can go on and you know, start looking at the words that come afterwards. So th what this generally works is for customers, uh, you imagine you have a, a text interface that's you know, transcribing as you go along. You'll see words in orange appear, and then they'll turn to white when the, the, the final transcript comes in there. But those words in orange can change over time. They'll change as we get more audio and as we determine, hey, another word's popped in. We're going to send this back to you with this intermediate transcript. And this really gives you the best of both worlds. This enables that immediate real-time response that is necessary to, to make this the revolution, but also gives you the word error rates if you're willing to wait and allows you to balance the two. You get to make the decision and with how you use this to make it work. So we're talking about the future. That was the title of this. What's the future of speech? 
A lot of people think that speech to text is about the text. I, I bet you there's a lot of people in, right here who think it's about the text. But there's probably a lot more in a growing number of you in this crowd that realize it has nothing to do with the text. It has to do with the answer you cared about. Most, other, other than, you know, truly like government uh, applications where you have to have a formal record of what was said or compliance where you had to have a formal record of exactly what's being said, most of the time you're caring about, you know, the meaning behind that text. Is the user inclined to say yes to your product? Are they happy with the service? Are they, you know, getting angry? That kind of thing. So the future is not text. The future is meaning. And that is happening already. Right now, the traditional stack is uh, some sort of speech-to-text solution, some sort of automatic speech recognition solution, followed by uh, a natural language processing stack afterwards, followed by custom you know, code on top of that. And what we're starting to see is this stack is collapsing and getting faster and getting better. And we're seeing more and more amazing solutions that get directly to meaning. Do you want me to predict angry? I can predict angry. And now you're not trying to scan text for it. I'm directly going from audio to angry. Now, this is something that it's an education thing for, for customers. We all know speech to text. We don't know speech to angry. So this is, this is the challenge as we go forward. But again, it's something that I think everybody's really starting to bite off on now. So what kind of applications can you do when you go beyond text? Um, you can do things like this. Hey, I've got a call center. Someone's calling in, and they are clearly angry. Has anyone here ever been angry on a call? I, I yeah. I have very, I am use case number one. That was just me transcribing myself. Uh, when you're angry, if you can detect that, it clearly can make a big difference. But more the point, it's not just detecting the customer, but feeding that back into and saying, maybe this particular person's best with this type of mood or this type of environment going in. You know, these are the powers. I can take an angry customer and keep them and turn them into a happy customer as opposed to an angry ex customer. And if I can pick the right person based off of that mood. This is the future, the power of getting to meaning and not just text. Other great things you can do with this. You can start tapping, obviously, sources of information that were a bit hard to access before. Clearly, we've got a lot of text throwing around the world. But there's also a, just a ton, a metric ton, not a standard ton, a ton of sources of audio that if you could react instantly to them, you could maybe make some financial gain on them. So we're looking for systems that can immediately pick out negative or positive and tell you who was negative, who was positive, getting more towards the meaning. This thing that was said was a negative event for this company. This thing that was said was a positive event for this company. We want to get to the meaning. We don't care about the text as much. Finally, other great things like this. Let's just talk about compliance. This is more pure text-based, but there's a bit of play. If you are very formal about the exact text that was said, um, that's what you need to do. You need to say these things are said. That's, that's one thing, but dealing with the vagarities of what did they say, yes or yeah or uh huh, getting to the meaning that they accepted the terms is, is the point. Things like real-time compliance checking become a real possibility. You're assisting that agent. You're making it possible for them to have a little checklist to say, yes, you met all the compliance wickets. Now you can actually sign that deal with them, that kind of thing. So all of this is what you can do, but it all hinges on this statement up here. I'm going to channel my inner Steve Ballmer. Who knows the iconic Steve Ballmer presentation? Developers, 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 developers. If it isn't easy to use, no one's going to use it, no matter how good it is. Um, so that's why we're here. We're finally getting the standards that are necessary. We've gone through the pain of rolling our own, and we've started integrating more features because our customers are demanding that. The, the standards are what is making this revolution happen. I want a junior developer to be able to jump on and just open up an audio stream and a data stream and be able to deal with us in a very natural, native way. And that's what is the final linchpin in enabling a revolution in speech. So are we there? Are we 
at that point for a revolution speech. I really believe it. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going into, you know, I'm, I'm preaching the gospel up here a little bit. But we are at that inflection point where we can now say, hey, we've got the hardware. We've got the standards that are making it easy. We're getting the accuracy that is what we demand and need. We're expanding beyond text. We are going to, very shortly, in the next couple of years, we're going to look back and do an amazing thing. No longer care because it's just so good. You just accept it. And that's when the real revolution, we'll say this amazing new huge set of applications came to bear because we had an input and output that we could accept and use, that we could just use with that, like we use a joystick or a keyboard. So that's where we're at. And that is the conclusion of my, my talk. I'd like to take any questions out there.